So again, let, let's let's begin with a case uh, again to help elucidate some of the concepts here. So, 36-year-old woman presents to the emergency room with severe migraine with visual changes. Indeed, she even has some hemorrhage sensory changes for 30 minutes, which improved with an aspirin. Uh, and your neurology colleagues in the end feel that it likely was a TIA. She did not have a stroke, most fortunately, at least no hemorrhage uh, that is apparent. Uh, she's got marked erythrocytosis, some mild leukocytosis, but it's present, thrombocytosis, and already has iron deficiency. Uh, so one might suspect that erythrocytosis would be even a little higher over time. Indeed, a very common finding in women uh, of menstrual age. She's sent to you for evaluation. Uh, she has pruritus, fatigue, some difficulties with concentration. Her mother also had had a central thrombocythemia. Uh, indeed, not to digress, but as one really digs deep, uh, the, the number of patients that can have a familial link is more common than you might expect. She has a palpable spleen tip. JAK2 is mutated with a 60% allele burden. The EPO is less than the test threshold. And you diagnose her as having polycythemia vera. What are your goals of therapy, both short-term and long-term? Well, I showed this slide earlier. And I think, again, these ELN guidelines in terms of therapy largely are focused on, uh, one, our goals, and two, the limitations of prior therapy. But perhaps I'll put you, uh, have you look at this bottom component here, which is around the area of cytoreduction, where, again, they say cytoreduction in individuals who are high risk or, and I think this is the important part that sometimes is glossed over, if you're intolerant to phlebotomy, if you have increasing spleen, if you have severe symptoms, if you have progressive leukocytosis, or if you have marked thrombocytosis. And again, I think this is, reflects some concern of increasing risk of particular hemorrhage that can occur as patients have more thrombocytosis. So recognize as part of these guidelines that this statement here in terms of worsening features of the disease are also currently in the guidelines in terms of the use of cytoreduction. Now, even at the time these came out, which was in JCO in 2011, we had the agreement that hydria or interferon as frontline therapy and then these others as second-line therapy. And this preceded the JAK2 inhibitor studies in these patients. Now, you've already seen this issue in terms of prognosis. I'll make the comment just to complement what was mentioned before. I think as we look at the issues that are in here in terms of age, I think the one factor that we don't have is really is a much more fleshed understanding of how comorbidities contribute to these risks for a few reasons. One, in terms of retrospective data analysis, these detailed data really are not in those databases to be analyzed to a great degree. Two, there's other components in there that really are just not uh, able to be assessed in terms of retrospective studies. Detailed influences in terms of symptoms such as pruritus or others. When one looks at a medical chart from 20, 30 years ago, you're lucky if physicians documented vital signs, you know, let alone if there was a, a nuanced discussion about pruritus. It, it just isn't there. So there's a lot of these scores are all helpful, but we must be very mindful of their limitations as well. And indeed, as I heard a, a comment earlier today, you know, I have a patient that has COPD versus has diabetes versus has certain types of cholesterolemia. Again, we don't have the richness of that data to really know how each of those might contribute for MPN patients. Now, one thing we have learned, and this was an important study done by our colleagues in Italy that we haven't discussed too much today, is that around the CytoPV study. Now, this was an interesting study. Tiziano Barbui and, and many of our colleagues came up with this study. And the hypothesis of this study was that any, plate, or any uh, hematocrit under 50 was likely equivalent in terms of decreasing the risk of vascular events. So their pretest hypothesis was saying 45 to 50 was likely the same as under 45, and that we were being too strict. We were making individuals iron deficient, and that there wasn't data to suggest that it really had to be as low as that. 
So they had this study, individuals were randomized to one of the two arms under 45 or 45 to 50. And what they found, and this has been well publicized of course, but it really was quite striking, is that the individual group that was 45 to 50 did have a much higher risk and it was almost independent of how one looked at the data regarding gender, age, risk, accounts, etc. So that the level of the hematocrit really mattered. Now a bit of the confounder is that uh, individuals either could or uh, either could or could not be on cytoreductive therapy. That was not uh, a, uh, it was not precluded one way or the other. So what contribution that had is a little difficult to know. But that hematocrit truly does matter. So I took away from this in terms of my patients, whether I'm treating them with medical therapy or phlebotomy, is really looking at the hematocrit level as a ceiling as opposed to kind of a midpoint. Because there are many individuals who every time they're checked need a phlebotomy. And if so, they're probably not being phlebotomized enough. If you're checking them and they're 47 in order of phlebotomy, you know, recognize that if they're checked a month later, they may spend half the month over that target goal of 45. So really look at it as a call to be a bit more strict. Now we've heard about the benefits of aspirin, and again, I think this is logical based on everything we've learned about aspirin in vascular events. And I think the issue of dose is relevant in that uh, higher doses may increase hemorrhage, but certainly 81 to 100, there is very solid data. We've seen the data in terms of hydrea being beneficial compared to placebo without question. And indeed, what about in P. vera itself? When P. vera, the strongest data clearly is hydrea versus phlebotomy. That was the PVSG data. This table, which was lent to me by Brady Stein, shows as well, as we look at other comparative cytoreductive therapies or such as people bromin, again, cytoreduction with hydrea is somewhat equivalent to cytoreduction with other myelosuppressive agents, but superior to phlebotomy. There's always the issue, and this can cause a fistfight in any NPN meeting, whether a hydrea is leukemogenic or not. People almost have a religious fervor, you know, regarding this topic. You know, as I tell patients, truly none of us can say for certain for one individual patient. There's a baseline risk of change, uh, and I can't tell patients in good conscience that there's a zero chance that it doesn't contribute in some way. It is a type of a chemotherapy drug. It certainly is not illogical that it could be harmful. It certainly can cause skin cancer. That, that we know of without question. So I'll tell them that I can't say that for certain it doesn't, but if this is somebody who's just had a stroke or Bud Chiari, you know, their risk of having a very serious vascular event is probably dramatically more risky than under-treating their disease by fearing hydrea. Now, what about resistance and intolerance? We had this discussion a bit uh, earlier, but I wanted to put up these criteria and show you. These criteria are helpful, but they are somewhat arbitrary. And the difficulty with these criteria, and I've contributed to some of these criteria, is regarding the thresholds of hydrea that are required to call someone resistant. So need for phlebotomy to keep the hematocrit less than 45 after three months of two grams per day. Platelets over 400 or a white count over 10 after three months of two grams per day. The reality is very few patients receive two grams per day of hydroxyurea. They're out there, but this is a minority. The practice in the US in particular, I think, is to treat patients to the maximal tolerated dose of hydrea. And then however good a response they have, that's where they stand. Is the plate it's 800? It's 800. If they need phlebotomy, they get phlebotomy. But few people push to two grams in part because they feel it's too toxic, whether it's because they're getting neutropenic or they don't tolerate it well, or just even the dose may cause some uh, concern amongst uh, our colleagues as well. Uh, the other components are around uh, Toxicities, leg ulcers, mucocutaneous, GI symptoms, pneumonitis, even fever. Hydroxyurea can cause fever. So again, a range of different ways one can fail hydroxyurea. I'd say that in many individuals, it's not really failing hydroxyurea. It's mainly that hydroxyurea is inadequate. It just isn't good enough. It's not that it doesn't help at all but rarely do we push it to get to these levels. 
I'm mindful because as an investigator, as we put this as a entry criteria in the trials, it is a devil of a thing to have source documentation to prove that people meet these arbitrary thresholds. For the largest part, that people just don't practice this way. So if I try to have people force the dose to two grams, they're just not gonna do it. And nor is there data to prove that they need to do that. So again, they're helpful, but again, a, a guide that perhaps are a bit too strict. Again, it's not lunchtime, so the obligatory <laughs> picture, I can show this because I was actually in the room when this picture was taken, uh, for when Patty Best uh, first described this in the Annals of Internal Medicine when I was her uh, a resident on her team. <clears throat> now, why these criteria, uh, they're a high bar, but they're not necessarily irrelevant in that our colleagues from Spain, they did a nice analysis and said, well, for the patients who actually meet these criteria of failing, they actually have a fairly tough disease. And in fact, the people who met that actually had clearly a worse survival. So again, that's a reflection of many things, but they did clearly do worse. Now, we won't belabor the, the, this slide from our colleague, uh, Jean-Jacques Kilajan. Pegylated interferon clearly active has been shown at MD Anderson in France and others, and is our ongoing study through the MPD Research Consortium. I will highlight a, a additional pegylated interferon molecule. Some of you have heard this discussion already in this meeting that there is a, a new player in this field, P1101, which Heinz Gisslinger has really been a leader in uh, the early testing of this drug, and uh, I'm pleased to be involved with some of these efforts as well. This is a longer-acting interferon alpha-2b. This is a pegylated proline interferon alpha-2b with a goal of being administered every two weeks. Now, the testing has largely been done with Heinz and his, uh, his colleagues in Austria. Uh, it's a, a compound with AOP uh, in Austria as well as with Pharmacentia. Now, these are some slides which Heinz showed me, but regarding their PVERA study. Now, these showing the activity of this as single agent in patients with PV and showing their decrease in need for phlebotomy over time on the therapy. Showing the ability for leukocytosis to be decreased or controlled with the therapy. Control of the thrombocytosis, so again, that, that suppression of the overt proliferation. Decreases in the JAK2 allele burden. As well as in this uh, very nice graph showing the percentage of folks in red who are complete responders, partial responders uh, in uh, the dark gray. So showing the, both the response rate and the cumulative response in the vast majority of individuals. It's on this basis that they have their randomized registrational study in Europe in PV patients uh, randomized between the P1101 versus hydroxyurea and that study is ongoing in uh, Europe. So our limitations of current PV therapy, I'd say that there's a few things. Insufficient efficacy for symptom control, the potential of vascular events even on therapy, therapy-related toxicity, or the risk of progression. So I'd mentioned before that these are heterogeneous patients. Now in this slide, this is a 519 PV patients with a heat map of their symptomatic burden. Symptoms in each line represents an individual patient from blue to red being highly present. And what you see is that there are distinct groups, and we published this in blood earlier this year, but not all PV patients are the same. It is true that maybe almost up to half of PV patients are less symptomatic than the other half. One can see fatigue is almost a contiguous red line almost across the entire board, and very pockets of very significant issues in terms of, uh, of difficulties with, with sexual intimacy and function, as well as a whole variety of other symptoms such as pruritus. So again, there can be significant difficulties with these patients. And again, that can be uh, independent of the issues of vascular risk. Now the other unmet need, and perhaps the most difficult one for us to answer in a short amount of time, is the issue of risk of progression. Indeed, as we look at that transition line from 
PV to post-PVMF. It is a continuous spectrum. And as we look at the inadequacy of current therapies and the, the interest of exploring JAK inhibition, interferon, other things, there are many components, inadequate symptom control, and do we impact this potential risk of progression? That is something that is uh, ongoing and important. Part of the challenge of knowing whether we're impacting this endpoint or we have very few good surrogate endpoints as to whether we are abrogating progression. Because the issue of just observing for rates of progression uh, is difficult just because of the slow rate of progression in the disease. So I'll leave you with this proposed algorithm and a potential place uh, as I introduced surge for JAK inhibition in 2014. So one, after the diagnosis of PV or ET, I'd say it's important to assess the risk score. The risk scores have limitations, but they are very helpful. I do think the symptomatic profile is incredibly important. I do think the control of the hematocrit likely is important. Whether we've given you the arbitrary label of PV or ET, it probably is a similar goal. Low-dose aspirin, again, is probably an important goal in most individuals. Then you need to decide on the need for concurrent cytoreduction based on the risk and the symptoms. If there are not, then monitoring for any of these things developing is important. If there is, then I'd say in 2014, the frontline cytoreduction still is a question between hydroxyurea and interferon. That's the only things that we really have data for at the moment. Now, with worsening symptom burden, vascular events, progression, or HU resistance or intolerance, I would consider in this space a JAK2 inhibitor trial, or one might consider if interferon has not been tried before, there may be select circumstances where that may still be a consideration as well. So again, an evolving paradigm, but one where I think we have a much greater depth of options than we have had uh, before, and I think this will be for the benefit of our patients. And uh, I'd like to obviously give credit to my group in Arizona, one that has to put up with me on a daily basis, but two, but for all of their efforts in MPNs and for our patients. And with that, I'll transition to our esteemed meeting chairman, Serge Rosavchik, to take us a little bit deeper into the, the evolving data of JAK inhibition in PV.